Hi, David. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm fine. Thanks. So, how's your day so far? Ah, uh, it's been busy. <laughs> 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 yeah. it's been one of those days <laughs> yeah busy day i think the weekend just started so all the load just shifted towards the weekend yeah so yep, yep. so david i have uh, you know i've seen your portfolio man it's a huge acquisitions yeah when we see your you know your profile your all the background i mean there are huge acquisitions they are huge business is so we're going to dig deep down uh, into that uh, after so first of all uh, we're going to start with a with a little bit of your background story that how you jumped up into business consultancy and how you end up being you know into all this whole kind of stuff well um you know for, for me uh with business it was it's almost something i had to get into Uh, I was I was not a good employee at all for some reason. Uh, <laughs> my my boss has never wanted me around for very long. Um, I was always pointing out things that were wrong, uh, the the way things could be better. So, um, you know, I, I I finally got into business seriously for myself in real estate um, okay. here in in the U.S. Which you know, a lot of people do that. You get a real estate license. A lot of people kind of treat it as a job. Um, it's not. Mm. It's your own company, um, but I just kind of kept looking at you know the money I made as a realtor, mm. and I could see how it would be better if I actually owned the brokerage instead of just hanging my license. Yeah, my hands on on doing what I was going to do. I just kind of kept taking the next step and next step, and before I knew it, I was buying real estate brokerages, and then you know again seeing that there was a chance to expand larger beyond that. um and i guess i think i was too young i was too naive to to be scared of what i was doing so <laughs> i just kept going <laughs> yeah i mean that's the beauty of the entrepreneurship and the whole journey when you are on your own path then i i think there is a kind of unknown zone but i think that's the beauty of the the right. whole entrepreneurship journey and I totally love that totally love that so you start up uh, you started as a realtor and then you ended up uh, you know owning the brokerage as a whole and then you know and then how this whole kind of thing started you know this whole acquisition stuff well i i got um first i i got some really good advice from a mentor that i had um which was to to look at ways to maximize profits which which what i started off doing was like looking at a real estate transaction realizing that the real estate company isn't the mm -hmm. only business making money off of the closing of a house There's insurance companies and title companies and on, on and on and i thought well i should get into those businesses because i'd make more money off of every transaction that we're already doing anyway mm -hmm. and of course i was going to all i knew how to do was you start a business and you know and grow it so i started my own title company first uh but then i i actually got a a business partner um who had been in finance okay. and um he said well you know really what you should be doing is is acquiring companies it's much faster he says you have a really good idea here but it'll take you 50 years to like put it together if you're going to start all, all this stuff he <clears> says in five years you could have it all assembled if you were just buying other companies that already existed and you know i was kind of at, at first um again it was like like almost too young and stupid to um realize like what's out there he explained it to me really quickly he explained it to me how you know you don't need piles of money to get this done you know that the businesses themselves finance it um he said oftentimes you know we can we can focus on maybe companies that are having trouble so they're not worth as much but they give us a nice base to build off of and he kind of explained the M&A to me at a real quick like 30,000 foot level. And so um I had a conference coming up where you had people from all over the country were together uh for the real estate franchise that I was part of. And I went there and just chatting with people, I ended up with 
a number of people saying, I'd love to have you buy me out. I'm, you know, this is right when the, the mortgage meltdown was happening and they were all kind of realizing they were in trouble. They probably weren't going to make it because they didn't have the money to keep this thing going. Um, and so I did my first acquisition which was literally a thousand dollars. It was an asset purchase. Uh, it was only a thousand dollars because that's what it, that's the minimum requirement in the state of Florida um, hmm. to make it a legal, a legal transfer of, of real property. Um, a, a lot of people think it only takes a dollar, but that's technically only between close family. But um, I bought another real estate office, which wasn't exactly what I was trying to do. But you know, then we bought another title company and merged it with ours. Uh, we got into the insurance business. Um, we got into uh, escrow only because there's some states in the United States that escrow and title are separated. And you know, my my partner, like, he wasn't kidding. Um, hmm. What had taken me like seven years to build this this little base that I was coming off of, um, just a year in acquisitions, we were already ten times the size of that. And it, it became really simple to go in, especially with the model we had mm. of we need a real estate office here. So we'd go and buy uh, like three or four of them and put them all together into one entity. We might use somebody's name that was good in the area still, um, you know, whatever it may be, or rename the whole thing, just depending. And then we'd bring our cir circle of companies in that, that go around that real estate transaction and kind of maximize the money that we could make. So even though we were in a, the, the economy was going down the drain with the great recession that was going on yeah, and the value of homes was going down, um, we, we kept making more and more money because we were growing faster than yeah. the industry was declining. So uh, I got like a crash course in an M and a and how, um, it can quickly uh, accelerate your growth and how you can come up against really a massive problem like the real estate industry had in 2008 uh, and you know come out victorious like in a short period of time. Right, right, right. I mean, that that's really wonderful that, uh, you know, the market is crashing, but I think at that time, the, the real estate is booming up. I think that 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 is one of the one of the major core that even though the market is de declining, but still, you know, I mean that's really wonderful. Uh, so, uh, at at which age, uh, David, you did your first acquisition, and uh, how how old how old were you at the time of your you know the first company when you started your entrepreneurship journey? Ah, uh, my, my very first. Well, as becoming a realtor, I was 24. Oh, right. Um, and so actually having my first brokerage, I was 20. I was 29. Um, right. And that's when I started acquisitions just six months after I had like officially started my own company. Right. Um, and then at 37, I'm selling everything off and, and retiring. So in that short period of time, went from i had like a, a nice business that most people would be excited about and say you have a comfortable living to like retiring very young and setting up a generational trust for my family uh just because of like the power of acquisitions and also taking advantage of um you know a, a down economy when people are afraid to invest you know most of most of the money is trying to sit on the sideline and wait till it's safe yeah if, if you ever listen to any of the really big um, you know, Warren Buffett's people like that out there, that's when they're out buying everything they can get a hold of. That's how they make their money. Um, yeah. When, they when, are, when, when the building's on fire, that's when you run in. You don't, you don't wait till everything's safe to go back in. So you have to be careful because obviously you can make mistakes when everything is having trouble. You can definitely make bad deals and lose money. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, another mentor of mine was a relative of mine from Greece. He had always taught me to develop a working model of a business. Once you have something that operates correctly, you know, you can, you can predict what your outcome is going to be. Then he said, it doesn't really matter the economy. 
uh, it's just the time scales differ between an up and up and a down economy. He says, and it can be, it doesn't matter which is up and down as far as which one's better. It depends on the business you're in or whatever. Um, but you know, we kind of came up with a, with a working model that, that, um, you know, allowed us to be highly successful when most of the businesses around us were closing uh, because we just looked at things differently, what we were trying to accomplish and everybody else. Yeah, that's really uh, nice. And one of the, you know, one of the major thing which I picked up uh, from this that uh, your mentor said that, you know, you have to focus on your ground skills. You have to focus on your core skills. And, you know, if your base is strong, if your grassroots level is, is strong, then it really doesn't matter wherever the market goes. You know, you have the deep foundation and, you know, you have the whole idea that how the things work. That's really wonderful. Right. So, right. You, yeah. So you jumped up into the business at the age of 24. And before that, you were em employed, right? So, it, yeah, it, I was go going to college. The, yeah. Odd jobs. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Odd jobs. So I thought I thought you you had the pre previous experiences of a realtor uh, before you owning your business. Okay, so it was right. after that. It was after that. Yeah. So I mean, in a way, you could say I was you know in that field for you know five years before I actually got really in business with it. Um, even though it's a business the whole time, obviously it's very different from mm. being a standalone person to owning buildings and company cars and all kinds of stuff like that. So, um, you know, it, it was kind of a big jump, but, um, and it was a lot of work, but, uh, you know, I, I had grown up very poor and I knew that just working some jobs, uh, um and and trying to have like an, an extra part-time job and that we i grew up with you know on food stamps and um food from churches being handed out i know our church paid our rent from time to time or else we would have been homeless um so i knew i had to be in business even though i didn't know how to be in business um yeah i did have my greek uncle who was very successful he, he was usually overseas but when he was around he liked me for whatever reason so he'd give me advice um i tried to take the advice i got from him growing up and put it to practice and i, I you know one of the things he told me is says you, you can't be afraid in business he, he says there's things you should be concerned about you should be paying attention to but he says as soon as you have fear in your mind don't think right you you can't come up with solutions to problems because your brain doesn't work properly mm -hmm. so he says there can be no fear he says there's always lots of solutions to whatever problem you have there, you'll never encounter anything there's no way to fix this so it's just like just keep your head straight and think this is what he'd always say always be thinking <laughs> That, that's really wonderful uh, uh, this is exactly the question which i was going to ask but you have answered it previously that uh, you know what it takes to be a uh, you know to owning a business or in the entrepreneurship journey what is that mindset which keeps you going when the going gets get stuff and i think yeah. when when you know your goals when you know that you know man i just have to do it i have to pay my bills i have to you know just keep going I think that's the kind of mindset yeah. you have. Uh, that's really you, wonderful. You've got that, the the you know the the kind of lizard part of your brain, like the ancient part, that the whole fight or flight yeah, um, mechanism flight. in your mind, yeah. you know, and its its job is to try to keep you safe, and so you something doesn't so a lion doesn't eat you or something, and it wants you to run away from problems because that's safer than than facing. Mm. Totally love that. Totally love that. Um, and that has worked very well. Through, not as useful today, though. But yeah, that's that's uh, it's not as useful today. So you have to like kind of fight that. You have to fight what your brain wants to do, which is give up. Um, you just keep going. Um, you know, in business, ninety six percent of businesses fail within ten years, mm. and. I, I read a statistic where uh, 
because obviously any idea you have for business, it's not unique. It's not brand new. There's lots of other people thinking the same thing, yeah, have totally. the same interests. I mean, there's totally. 8 billion people on the planet. So lots of other people are thinking about it. But the percent of them will, will let, let fear prevent them from even starting the business and trying. So totally. it's like you're ahead of 70% of people just starting. Yeah, and then that, that's if really you just wonderful. keep going, you're ahead of 96% of those people after 10 years because they've all failed and quit. So it's like you're going to be like top 5% period if you just keep going. <laughs> Even yeah. if you're not very good at what you're <laughs> yeah. doing, you're still going to be a top 5%. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. <laughs> so if you know that, like you have really good that's, odds of being that's successful. <laughs> that's really optimistic, man. That you you just you are just keep going, you are no, and and still you are, you know, above Eventually, there's that, nobody left. That. It's just you. <laughs> And then you're going to think that, man, now let's do, now let's work snack. That's really wonderful. And I really love that when you say that you just have to keep start and you are ahead of 70 person because the majority of the person, you know, they yeah. just, they I just mean, live in the fear and, you know, they just keep thinking that man, someday, someday, and that someday will never come eventually. That's really wonderful. Yeah. That's really wonderful. I think so, that's a big problem today with, with people um looking for like the the quick fix like the magic pill like makes it all happen in a hurry a lot of things in business can't happen in a hurry it does take time there's a certain amount of patience you have to have to get there and there's also times where you need to be able to run really fast like mm -hmm. to get to where you need to be so it's it's choosing your moments of when you're going fast and when you're going slow um but if you're even halfway decent at that you can be very successful in business yeah i think in in today's it is due to that you know the quick quick you know the everything is so quick the social media the quick you know the exception ratio everything is quick you know the, you just post one thing it goes viral so um, i think that's the, that's why the people are in such a hurry that they don't understand the you know the core factor of the thing that you know you have to keep your pace you have to know your pace then when you have to go fast when you have to you know steady and yeah that's that's really a, a good point to ponder on so so david in in the all the companies which you have purchased your acquisitions and all the businesses so uh, what's the category is like uh, does it your portfolio includes only the realtors or real estates or any other kind of you know businesses uh, your majority part of the portfolio well we 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 have it, it was it was all financial one way or another so it was real mm -hmm. estate it was title mm -hmm. it was insurance it was companies that would service any of those businesses um we also had financial services so we actually were involved in like investing money for pension funds mm -hmm. um not in our own, not in our own stuff because that's illegal but um our our clients from the other companies they would often transfer their portfolios over to us and we would invest that money for them um or help them do acquisitions um mm. that's where some of my a, the weirdest things i've ever come across as far as companies people had what they wanted to do <laughs> i just shake my head like how does this person have a whole bunch of money like this is the worst idea i've ever heard in my life <laughs> And we'd, we'd have to like think how to politely talk them out of it because it was just like this is so bad and like this one guy wanted to have a, a a bottled water company he wanted to call it everglades spring water it's like well the everglades is a giant swamp in florida it's mm. one of the largest swamps in the world it's like i don't think people want to drink spring water from a swamp where alligators mm. swim around and stuff like yeah, it was a really bad name. And he was like arguing with us over the name. I'm like, no, no, it's a bad name. You got to change that. <laughs> it's like a terrible name. So, so what is the, what is, uh, according to you, I mean, you have already a huge portfolio. So, according to you, what is your, you know, the top acquisitions which you really enjoyed? And, you know, you think that this is one of our, our best acquisitions we have made so far. And what's that story behind that? the best acquisition i ever made was purchasing an escrow company in southern california um it was it was something i was doing anyways because the, the title business is split up in two different 
companies in Southern California for some reason. I don't know why. Mm-hmm. It's like a local custom thing. Nowhere else in the country is it like that little corner of um, Arizona is the same way. And I bought that because we had to have it because without it, we couldn't hold anybody's money um, for the title company. Mm-hmm. And um, this is like a this is a dumb luck kind of thing. But the person that we went into business with wa- like went to school with a guy who was kind of a mess of a human being, but he was from a family who started um, one of the two underwriting companies in the entire United States for all title insurance. And so no matter where you're buying a house in the U S you're going to get your title policy from one of these two firms and his, the, the board of directors or whatever, this company is all his family members. Now he's not part of it cause he's kind of a black sheep of the, of the family, but um, he was always coming in and bugging me, trying to have me pay him to be a consultant, to have me introduce, have him introduce me to all kinds of Southern California's big business elite and, I I knew he was just kind of a BSer, so I ignored him for a while. But uh, one day he came and and just said, "Hey, uh, if I can get you a meeting, you know, with my my uncle, because um, they're looking for a way to to get overflow business um, taken care of for a few years, so they don't want to have to go and hire thousands and thousands of employees to take care mm-hmm. of all of the foreclosures that were going on." And then have to lay them all off and pay unemployment and everything else once they're done with this because they won't need them anymore once this is finished. He says, if I could get you an, appoint- uh, an appointment like that, would you hire me as a consultant for a year? I was like, uh, I don't know. How much money do you want? You know, And he said he wanted 10000 a month. I said, no, <laughs> I'll pay you 5000 a month. And he's like, how about seven? I said, it'll depend on, on how much business it actually is. And he says, all right good enough he got me um their headquarters and met with him and a couple of his um vps and they laid out this plan they had of having outsourcing to other title companies is it was essentially organizing these mountains of paperwork into files that were complete so they could then go to a judge have the property closed foreclosed on so the, the bank can have it back and then go resell it and move on with life. And uh, um, in there, it went a lot better than I thought it would. You know, it's hope that you'd be worth much. That's <laughs> like, thanks. But I can see where that would come from. And he laughed and he said, well, we would like to give you a try. You know, we're, we're going to bring a few companies on. He uh-huh. says, you know, the the smallest amount we can do is, is 5,000 homes a month. You know, can you handle that? And I said, sure, we can handle that. We, at the time, were, we were closing like maybe 250 homes a month. <laughs> Couldn't handle 5,000 homes. But <laughs> I was sitting there just like, oh, my God. And so he's, all right, you know, handshake. He says, Let, we'll get the contracts to you on Monday and, and we'll FedEx boxes to your offices in Florida. Uh, we'll be there by Wednesday. And, you know, we need to have everything finished up by the end of the month so that we can go ahead and get them into court next month. Hmm. And he says, and if you right. do good, we'll, we'll add more. I was like, awesome. So I walked out of there. I called my, my manager back in Florida who, who ran our title company. I said, hey, how's it going? You know, got a bunch of business coming in and she was all excited. She's oh awesome from where? I said, hey, first American title. And um it's gonna be five thousand closings. She's like, for the year? Like that's incredible. I said, No, no, no. In the next three weeks, um, we have to figure Man, out how to close these. I that's said, huge. I'm like, now don't worry. There's no actual closing. You just organize the paperwork and you let them know what's missing and She's like, do you know how long it'll take? I go, it'll take three weeks because that's all the time we have. <laughs> I'm going to have to hire like 50 people. I said, I know. That's why I'm calling you right now. I just walked out of the building because the boxes will be there Wednesday, like a truckload of them. So mm-hmm. um, that acquisition 
which ended up being like a mess of a company that I actually acquired. Um, it was difficult to manage. Um, it was just a Southern California thing. Everybody was a just a giant ego that worked there. And I was so happy when I sold it because it was just completely annoying. But mm. it opened up the door to like this massive relationship that grew other businesses that we had like almost a hundred fold in, in some cases. So while obviously none of that's planned because it was sheer luck, um, you'd be like shocked that what, what you run into when you're doing acquisitions and you're networking with lots of people as you're trying to do the acquisitions, mm. uh, you, you end up meeting, you know, former sports stars and, and, you know, TV commentators and politicians and governors and all kinds of weird stuff. You're like, how am I like sitting here talking to these people? And it's just because like you're trying to buy businesses. And so yeah, you're in totally. these like small circles of people. Yeah. Totally. Um, so, you know, while again, I know your, your question was kind of like, well, like the best deal, that was the best deal to me. The actual business itself was so, so we made mm -hmm. money, but I was happy when it was gone. Um, when I left California, I sold out of that state because I couldn't stand doing business there anymore. But um, it's unreal, like what that opened up for us. Yeah, I think I think when you when you made a huge acquisition like that, and you know the huge business, then it will eventually open up a new doors, new countless doors of opportunities, yeah. and then you know then you realize that's that a, that's one thing that's about the first step. Yeah. You, you 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 find out pretty quickly when you have when you're working on deal flow as you're trying to find acquisitions mm. and as you're closing deals and the former owners are happy they tell people that they've known in business for years about you just like when a, a customer buys has really good food at a restaurant they tell their friends oh the food there's so good um and when people have a bad experience they'll they tell like 10 times as many people that yeah. it was terrible yeah. but mm. totally. um pretty, pretty quickly you have people calling you to see if you if you'd like to buy them rather than you searching all the time like which is like one thing about m a that that once you have deal flow working it kind of works positively in your direction it's something you should definitely think about that's really wonderful that's really wonderful uh, so so david uh, what do you suggest uh, for the newcomers for all the beginners who you know who want to start their own businesses you know who wants to you know jump right into the entrepreneurship journey so but they're afraid i think of course they're afraid they have doubts in their head but deep down they want to do it so what are your suggestions uh, for uh, the beginners well you know, when you're just starting off, yeah, obviously everything is, there's fear involved and that's like natural. Like we already talked about, it's what stops most people to begin with. Yeah. Um, and it's easy for me to be cliche and just say, you know, just don't have any fear and go for <laughs> it. Like that doesn't really help anybody. Yeah. Um, for me, in my mind, numbers always work best. Um, I quote a lot of numbers when I say stuff online and you know, only 5% of the population um, really makes any amount of money. Um, everybody else below that is somewhere or they're paycheck to paycheck or they're, you know, down to the poverty line or worse. Um, they're struggling to make it through life financially. And money is not everything, but it does help with some things. Um, in that 5%, there are very, very few people who are there because they had a job and they invested wisely their whole life. There are a few there, but not many. Hmm. Um, almost all of those people owned businesses. Usually, they owned multiple businesses. Yeah, and they and some and the ones that are at the very high end of that, they grew enormously large businesses. And so, even if you're, again, you know, kind of like we talked about earlier, if you just stick around long enough, you'll be the only person left. You know, in, in business. Even if you're not nearly as successful as other people in business, if you if you get started, especially at a young age, and you keep going, and you can have a failure, 
I've had six businesses I had to close early on. I you know made mistakes, didn't do things the right way, didn't know what I didn't know. Um, a lot of it was lack of planning, you know, not having a, cl- a clear goal of what I was trying to do. Hmm. But um, even if you're just okay at it, um, you'll be in that top five percent because businesses have all those tax advantages, almost regardless of what country you're from. Um, they get to operate completely different than humans do as far as how you're, how you're taxed and, and everything. So, you know, it, this is like the path to, to climb out of poverty and, and to reset things for your family, you know, to be able to get your family ahead. Um, I came from a very poor background and, um, you know, it, I still wasn't making any money until I had my own business. And so the amount of effort I put in, you know, the results of that came back to me that way, not to somebody else who made money from all my efforts. Like I did when I had a job. Um, and so even though it's scary and even though you may fail or it may feel like nothing's going to work out, you know, you, you need to start and you need to keep going. And, and every time you fall down, you need to get up and keep going. Um, it will get better. You know, you're going to have some mistakes. Everybody has mistakes. I still make mistakes today in business. Um, I almost never make the same mistake twice, but there are plenty of mistakes to make. So yeah. uh, um, you just learn from them. And you got to you realize that like you're a human being, nobody's perfect. Um, the greatest, you know, business tycoons in the world you know they, they're all divorced you know they, they have parts of their life that have not turned out correctly um you know so you can't you can't like fail and do a bad job all you can do is is accomplish the things that you're going to be capable of accomplishing and it is well worth the effort that you put in because when you get to the other side um you know and you have something where you know your kids and grandkids are going to good schools you can help them out with starting a company or buying a first home or whatever because you were successful in business. Um, it will have been it would be well worth the those nights where you couldn't sleep because you're wondering how on earth you're going to make something work. Um, so you know, whenever I'm asked this kind of question, I, I always I'd like to give some like three step thing or something, you know, of how you can get started. But the the truth is, just get started. And know that you're going to fail and make mistakes. Yeah. It, it, when you're 75 years old, if you're still in business, you'll still be making some mistakes. Like it'll still happen. Like don't worry about it. It's natural. That's totally. Um, that's totally. You know. That's totally marvelous. And you know, um, it all come. It all comes down to the the very one basic thing that you just have to start. I mean, that's yeah. it. That's it. Thinking about it isn't going to make it happen. You have to yeah. actually start. Yeah. You can think about and plan all you want. You'll never be able to plan anything to perfection. As soon as you start, you'll discover all kinds of things you didn't know about or you were incorrect about. Yeah, and that's okay. You just you fix the problems and you keep going. Yeah, I think the majority of the problem is that, you know, the keep thinking. Majority of the people just keep thinking in their head. You know, just keep dreaming about their successes, about, you know, how they want to do it. But at the later stage of their life, when they get older, then all the regrets, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So right. I, think, I think that is one of the, you know, one of the very basic thing and one of the best ways to just get started and figure out the rest on your way. Yeah, because no matter how much thought you put into it, you will have not scratched the surface of what you'll have to figure out down the road. So you might as well just get started and deal with it as it comes. <laughs> That's really wonderful. That's really wonderful, David. And uh, it's really nice talking to you. It's really nice knowing your journey. It's really nice knowing your humble background, how you started, you know, and when you have a clear purpose, when you have a clear goal in your mind, when you know your why, I think why is very much important. That why you want to do it. It is. Yeah. Why you want to do this. If you don't have your why, then I think 
you aren't getting enough inspiration to do that so i think you have a clear yeah, I, I had a wife i had a wife and children that i i wanted to make sure they could do the things in life that they wanted to do that yeah. was important to me you know i'd get my butt out of bed and i didn't feel like it cuz i just i got to i got to go today you know got to make this happen that's really that's really wonderful that's really wonderful so david uh, uh, once again thank you so much for being on the show and uh it was really nice talking to you and knowing your whole journey so before we wrap this up uh, just uh, one or two quick questions that uh, uh you have trained you have also a consultant and you provide consultancy to different individuals or the businesses i guess so uh, how that whole things works and how the whole model works uh, before we wrap this up yeah so i i have a a company called ethical empires and what we do is you can do one of two things with us you can hire us as a business consultant to help you grow your company so m&a would be part of that we help you buy other businesses um but as kind of like a monthly consulting fee we basically come in and streamline your op- operations we help you instead of you taking 15 or 20 years to learn all the little tricks of the trade um we help get those installed in your business as fast as possible so that you can you can run more efficiently and then that free, frees up cash flow to be able to go and do more acquisitions you know you, you can do some acquisitions without any money right but it's easier if you have some money um it opens up the the field a lot more the second is is some people um will hire us just to do acquisitions they pay us a retainer and we go out and find a company that's in an area that they're interested in and negotiate the deal and all they have to do is sign for the financing and and close on it and those people have an option then of just doing their own thing or they can pay us a monthly amount to actually run the business for them keep track of management that kind of thing make make like executive decisions to to uh to make it make it work right that's really wonderful that you have you know the two different kind of morals uh the first one is that people hire you as a consultant and you provide your consultancy services to them and the other one is uh, they just you know they do investment of the acquisitions and you do all the stuff for them uh, you find the companies you acquire them and then you know all that kind of stuff right 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 that's really wonderful. yeah it's kind of like standard m and a like you just you just pay a firm to do this for you Mm-hmm. um most of our clients right now they're on that more on that like just monthly consulting retain, um deal where we're just helping them keep doing all, all their course corrections constantly to stay in the middle of the road and and um make progress as fast as possible right right and uh, that's really wonderful uh, just uh, just last question david before we wrap this up that uh, any a large final advice uh, for the people or for the audience or any mistakes that uh, for the audience that the any mistakes to avoid in this journey or in this entrepreneurship journey or in this you know acquisition journey what are some major steps that most of the people do and how they can avoid that um for me personally I know this this was what bit me the worst was being impatient. Um impatience has cost me far more money change in law or taxes or anything like that. Um being in a hurry like has always bit me um mm. like 9 times out of 10. Uh there are times in business where you need to be in a hurry to get something done in a timely fashion. It's important money-wise, but um you need to make sure you understand what you're doing what's the worst case scenario of it how you're going to how you can mitigate that um if you don't have a clear picture of of what could come up with this and how you're going to handle it um it almost assuredly will come up and now you're in crisis mode because everything's going wrong and you haven't thought about this at all mm-hmm. and you're in this position because you hurried so i know i did an acquisition where because I've done a whole bunch in a row and been really successful. You know, I got a big head and you know, I'm the man and I can't do anything wrong, I guess. 
And I rushed into something just because there was a part of this business I wanted that I knew was perfect for what we were doing, which it was. Huh. Business itself was garbage, but I wanted this part of this business. And I didn't take the time to let due diligence and everything finish up. You know, my attorneys told me, don't wait, you know, we got another month probably before we're ready. And I'm like, I don't have a month for this. Like, this is killing me. So I bought it anyways. And I started using this piece, which it immediately was beneficial. Like I knew it would be, but then I ended up finding out that there was a lawsuit this company had and I now own the company, which therefore I'm the one being sued. And I lost three weeks after, um, I closed on it. Uh, we settled the thing for seven million dollars. So I lost seven million dollars in three weeks Man, because that's huge. I was place. in a hurry. Now, did the thing I bought make us a lot of money? And it didn't really matter in a way. Yes, I mean we definitely made a lot more money than that seven million we lost. But there was no need to lose that money if I would have just listened to the people I was paying <laughs> to do the job. I would have found out about this and I would have been like, all right, well, we're just going to do an asset purchase of this, this part of your company. We're not interested in the rest and your lawsuit and everything else. And they may have said no, because they were trying to dump this on somebody. Yeah. Um, and, and because of the money we made with that piece, I could easily sit here and go, it really wasn't a mistake. We just, we needed that piece, but it was a mistake. I made a huge mistake being in a rush. So, you know, I can tell you that it doesn't feel good to lose seven million dollars in three weeks. <laughs> it's a really bad feeling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Man. And when I think yeah. back at it, it still feels really bad thinking about it. It hasn't gotten any better with time. So <laughs> I did really well, and I sold that company and exited it, and it was great. And I still think about that mistake I made um, to this day of just how stupid that was. So um, be patient. When you're when you're starting this journey and through the whole thing, make sure you know what you're you know what you're doing. You'll never know everything, but I mean, you you shouldn't just run blindly into stuff either. Like you can't be in that much of a hurry because it will bite you. Um, it'll bite you every time. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, that's really insightful, and you know, I'm sure the the audience would love to you know all the insights so um, and david uh, once again thank you so much for being on the show and for your valuable time and all the insights which you gave gave us and it was really wonderful talking to you and i really enjoyed the whole conversation hey, thanks for inviting me I, i had a lot of fun here today too yeah thanks lord have a good day take care mm-hmm.